So, I made a compile time game that I named Metacrush Saga, and it was a pet project I made last summer, and I really wanted to share with you the learnings that I had from that project about metaprogramming, about uh, C17, so we will dive into that. First, what do I mean by a compile time game? I think to understand that, we should take a look at the life cycle of a standard game, and we will compare it with the life cycle of a compile time game. So, a standard game usually starts by writing the source code of it, which you compile, and this is giving you an executable. That executable, you can start it, which will spawn a process. And within this process, usually you have a kind of a game loop that will run the logic of your game. So this game loop is rendering, updating, rendering, updating, again, and again, and again. And to be able to react from the player, you need to uh, give the player inputs into the, the update function. Okay. So what would be the life cycle of a compile time game? We still need to run some kind of game logic, so we still have some source code to, to run that logic. And we will compile the game. But this time, instead of just compiling, we will also run the game logic within the compilation phase, within the compilation step. And this is possible in C17 using constexpr, or template metaprogramming, which kind of permits you to interpret some code at compile time. So since we are compi uh, computing the new state, we also need to inject the player inputs at that point in time. This is going to give us an executable. And since most of the logic has already been computed within the compilation phase, this executable is going to be very simple. It has only one responsibility, which is to output the state of the game. And it's going to output it in an ASCII format. So it's a one-shot process. There is no loop inside this executable. Just output the game state. All right, so we have some kind of way to do some game logic, but that's not very interactive. We need to have some kind of loop to play this. So how could we make this uh, into a loop? Well, we will just copy the game state, put it into a file, let's call it current state, and combine it again with the source code. So by combining both of these, we have enough information to compute the next next state of, my, of the game. And this is a game loop. So that's my game loop. Funny, isn't it? Funny, but you will still ask yourself a question. Why would you even do that? Or what the, what the hell? Hmm? Because we can. Because we can. So it's a tricky question, and I prepared some tricky answers. First, it's blazing fast. There is almost no runtime. Everything is done at compile time. Great. Uh, it is very safe. You cannot allocate memory at compile time, so no dangling pointers or things like that. Uh, if you like cryptic languages, that's something for you. And uh, uh, it makes you a very good over-engineer, I would say. <laughs> and if, when you're in Sweden, sometimes it feels a bit cold, you know? So. Warming yourself with your CPU might be a nice idea. So what I'm trying to say to you is that doesn't make any sense, right? That this is just not a very good idea in an industrial project. But I was inspired. I was inspired by this guy, Matt Bjorne, a very smart guy, um, who made a nibbler at compile time. Oh, don't want to spoil you. Uh, so it's a kind of a snake game that he made using C++11 and template metaprogramming. And I wanted to do the same. I, I'm working on Candy Crush, so I wanted to do the same, but in C++17. And it was kind of a bet also with my colleague. And uh, C++ should always be an inspiration for you. So that was my inspiration. So maybe 
The question that you should ask yourself is not why would you even do that, but how could you even do that? How is that possible to do this in C++? Well, it's possible because you have some features that permit you to do this. And doing that kind of pet project maybe doesn't make sense at work, but it makes sense to explore these features. So C++17, metaprogramming, it's kind of fun to do it by doing a game. And it's also a nice way to prove that C++ has multiple three incomplete languages within itself. We can compute a game, we can compute anything, I guess. So if you want to take a look at my project, uh, you can go on GitHub and take a look at the source code of it. Some part of it will be a bit different. I try to simplify things in these slides. And also I've noticed some, some things that could be made in a better way, so I will try to update my code uh, later on. And I think it doesn't work on GCC 7.2. It only works on GCC 7.1. Right, so that's my game. Uh, looks like Candy Crush, maybe, a bit. Uh, it's a board, you have some items, you need to swipe them to increase your score. Simple. So I, I'm not going to explain too much about the rules, that's not super interesting, but it's just like you, you swap things, you uh, match them, increase your score, and get happy. So the rules are not interesting, but the architecture is quite, quite interesting. And we will try to dive into each part of this architecture. Not too much, it might be a bit scary. So just dive enough to understand how does it works. So first, how do we combine this file current state with the source code? When I say to you that I was copying the game state into an ASCII file, I was lying a bit to you. It's not just the game state, it's actually a raw string literal. So this big R notation, it says that this is a raw string, and even though I'm breaking lines, this is still part of the, of the string. How do I combine that? Simple. I have a loop inputs file, header file, which contains all the inputs necessary for uh, running one step of the my game loop. So at the top, I'm getting the keyboard inputs as a macro, preprocessor macro, and the Game state is just an include preprocessor uh, command, yeah, command, that I put into a variable that I named game state string. So the, it is just as simple as this. I'm just including things into my source code. So now we know how I combine this with my source code. How can I compute the new state? Is it simple? Quite simple. So I have this main CPP uh, file where at the top I'm including the loop inputs to be able to uh, get the current state of the game and the keyboard inputs. I need to pass this current state uh, from ASCII to some object representations that make more sense to manipulate. I can feed my game engine and uh, update this engine to compute the new state of my game. Once I have the new state, I need to transform it back to something meaningful for the player, which is a stood array of characters. That's what I do. And I need to output it. The beauty about this is that all this line, minus the last one, is done at compile time. So all of this is run by the compiler when I'm compiling. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. That's kind of fun. So what I'm using to do this is a lot of usage of this const expert keyword that you see, um, uh, also using template metaprogramming to compute some types. Yeah. So now we know how to combine, we know how to compute the new state. How do I glue things all together? Um, I'm cheating a bit. I'm using my super bash skills to do a loop, a game loop. So at the top, I'm starting my compilation to compute the new state, which is also, by the way, a computation. So we could call it a compilutation if you want. Uh, I'm grabbing the 
keyboard inputs in the meantime to be able to have the inputs for the next run of the loop. Clearing the screen, removing the, the board, I grab the, the executable, the renderer, ask to show the, the, the game state using echo, and I copy, by the way, the state into the file, current state. And that's, that's my game loop. So it's compilation, printing, compilation, printing, again and again and again. Uh, so I will show you the, the beast. So I, I was a bit scared to do this live, so uh, yes, I will show you a video instead. So that's my game. Uh, it is pretty boring. <laughs> it is pretty ugly and pretty slow. But, but, but it, I mean, it's working, and all of this is done at compilation. That's, that's crazy that you can do that kind of game logic at compilation. But, I mean, who would have expected that? Is this real-time? Yeah, this is real-time, yes. It's less than one frame per second. <laughs> Approximately 0 0.5. Uh, yeah. So that's the game, not, not uh, yeah. Don't know what to say about that. So what did I learn by doing this? Especially concerning C++17. Oh, maybe I should put it back. Like this, perfect. Well, the first thing that I learned with C++17 is that we are spoiled kids. We are really spoiled when it comes to metaprogramming. It is so much simpler to do metaprogramming than it used to, than it used to be. The code that you would write for runtime computations will be very easily transformable into a code that you can uh, use for compile time computations. It's very simple. It used to be a nightmare in the past. No, you can just most of the time use constexpr to, uh, yeah, you, you just put a bit of constexpr everywhere and things will run at compile time. So I will give you an example. In the past, if you wanted to do uh, compile time branching, so basically, you try to ask your, your compiler, if this condition is met, run, uh, take this code path, otherwise, take another one. So here I have uh, this serialized function, which takes an object. If this object has a member function called serialize, call it. Otherwise, use std to string. OK. And to do this, I'm using std in a belief. Who understand this code in this room. Yeah, more people than expected. But honestly, the first time you see this, if you're a beginner in C++, you just want to grab your desk, flip it, and crush your computer. Because that, that, that doesn't make sense, right? It's impossible to understand. But this is gone. Trash. In C++17, you can use the if keyword combined with the constexpr keyword and this gives you uh, compile time uh, branching. So here I'm saying, OK, is my object having a serialize? If yes, you will compile to object.serialize. Otherwise, you will compile to std to string. Is, it, is this a bit more readable? Yeah? Yeah, OK. Yeah, it is. But if is not the only thing that you can const explore. You can const explore all the things. At least that's what Ben Dean and Jason Turner say. Uh, go check their YouTube video. They explain a lot about what you can do with const explore. You can pass some JSON, for instance. Huh. So you have const explore lambdas. Some standard library algorithm can be made const explore, like Beyond did, for instance. Some containers are const explore for free. And even if they are not constexpr, most of the time, you can just steal the implementation and write constexpr in front of it. Be a bit careful when it comes to like a property on low and that kind of things. So like, copy something that is uh, open source and copyable first. But then, yeah, it works. You just add constexpr and things become constexpr by magic. 
99% of the time. But there is one question left. Uh, how do you debug constant expressions? How do you debug something that is run at compile time? Uh, you would need to debug your compiler somehow. Yeah, that's not fun. You can't. You could use some static assets or uh, some tools like template, templar. But they are not very simple to use. What I would suggest to you is instead of trying to, to, to debug your compile time uh, expressions, make them runtime expressions. And there is a very simple way to do this. Instead of using constexpr straight away, wrap it into a macro, uppercase constexpr. And then when you want to make all these things not constexpr, define it to empty. And they become runtime expressions. So you can debug them. This doesn't work in all the places. Sometimes you really need a constexpr expression. So use it wisely. Mm. Who remember this source code? That was the source code I, I mean, that's my loop inputs header file where I am including the game state. Okay. There is something weird in this code. So I have a constexpr per lambda. I explained to you that I use constexpr per everywhere, so nothing weird there. But why is it a lambda? Why? Is there any needs for lambda here? Someone in this room should know about that, Bjorn. I will try to explain to you why. Let's say that you have a parse board size function, which returns you the, the size of your game, the size of the board, so how many cells you have, according to the ASCII representation of that game board. And you want to parse the board, so we have a parse board, parse board function, which is constexpr as well. And within this passboard function, you want to declare a std array, which will contain the, the item that are inside my board. And I want it to be the size, uh, the size of the board. So I'm calling passboard size right here. And your compiler is going to be a bit nasty and say to you, well, you cannot do that. You cannot do that because game state string, uh, game state string is not a constant expression. It's not constexpr. The reason for this is that, oh, sorry, no spoil. Uh, the arguments of constexpr functions are not constexpr themselves. So even though passbar side is constexpr, when I'm calling it right here, I'm using an argument which is not constexpr. So you would think, OK, I remember what John said. You should put constexpr in front of things, and they become magically constexpr. Well, that's not the case for arguments. I'm sorry. You cannot do that. So how do we solve that issue? Constexpr lambda. Instead of using the value, uh, instead of passing the value straight away, you wrap your value into a constexpr lambda, which will return that value. And you call your function as, as you would earlier. And in passboard, I need to, instead of getting the argument straight away, I need to uh, call that lambda to extract the argument. Does that make sense? Not really. Not really, because game state string is uh, still an argument. But it works, and I don't care. That solved my problem. <laughs> if you want to read about that, you should go on Dion's blog. He, he has a nice explanation about this. How do you transform? string into types, and he, had, he ran into the similar issues where you need to uh, have an argument that, that needs to be constexpr. Right, Dion? Yes. OK, so now we understand why I'm using this constexpr keyword for my lambda. But there is another weird thing. Constexpr string, what, what, what is that? Why am I not just using a string? Because it's convenient. It is convenient because my constexpr string class is exactly like std string, but constexpr. Makes sense. Since we cannot allocate memory at compile time, uh, I'm using a fixed capacity for my string. So I need to pass this as a template argument. I'm not heap allocating. 
anymore, so I'm stuck allocating things. But it still really looks like a stood string. And that's uh, quite a genius idea. Because it turns out that some piece of code that you would write using stood string will look very similar if you replace this stood string by const expo string. So here I'm trying to find in a game state, my game state ASCII representation, where is the first blue item in this game state. And uh, yeah, I'm using std find if here. Uh, I think std find if is not const expo. So most likely what I did was stealing std find if and put const expo in front of it. There's another gem in this code, which are C++ 17 deduction guides. What are deduction guides? If you have a class template, uh, so in the past, if you have a class template and you have a template parameter for that class template, that n for instance, and that you use this parameter into your constructor, when you instantiate that class, either you would need to specify that parameter, or you would need to write that kind of function, like make const expo string, to be able to deduce this template parameter. And this is ugly. This is ugly, but it is gone as well. C++ 17, much simpler. The template parameters are automatically deduced. So here, n will be deduced to the, the size of this string literal. This is nice. And in, in some cases where it gets a bit more difficult to deduce the template parameter, you can help the compiler by writing some deduction guides to say, you should deduce things in that way. Const expo string was something that I made, but there was also a lot of const expo containers that were provided by uh, C++ 17. So std optional for optional values, std pair, std array. Sadly, std variant was not part of them. In GCC 7.1 and lib standard C++, at least the one that I use, uh, I had some issue using std variant and make it const expo. And std variant, I think, could be made const expo. I'm not guaranteeing this, but I think it should be possible. There was also other, another disappointing thing, is that structured bindings uh, weren't const expo uh, compatible. So structured bindings is a fancy way to extract from a, a pair or a tuple the value that are contained. And this is not const expo. You cannot add const expo in front of it. That's very sad. Performance wise. Uh, nah, yeah, it is bad. I told you my game is running at one frame, less than one frame per second, so it's not, not so good. So you will ask me then why would you do that kind of compile time computations? Well, I think that most of the time it's it's not so much an issue to have a, a, a bit longer compile time if you have a, a much faster runtime. And the, the more computation you can do during the compilation phase, the less you will do at runtime. So maybe it, it is bad because things are interpreted, but it's worth trying to do them at, at compile time. CRA seems to be faster than std array, for instance. Uh, std array is kind of an abstraction, encapsulation of a C array in a better, fancier interface. And this has no cost at runtime, but it has some cost at compile time. Loops also seems to be slower than recursion. Most likely because when you do loops, you are manipulating data, uh, writing data, and this seems to be slow at compile time on GCC. Same goes for copying data, um, so arrays, um, things like that. And also, since my uh, game has only one uh, compilation unit, I'm only using one core to run my game. So it's slow. So that was for Metacrush. But I would like to do a Metacrush saga, which is a bit better. What could I do that would be fancy? What if I try to remove the runtime entirely? Like this. 
So we will need to find a way so that the compiler outputs the game state. How could we do that? I know two things that compiler can output, errors and warnings. Okay. So uh, I tried. I gave it a try. I tried to output the game state as a warning using this deprecated keyword. So you can see I can print ABC at compile time. And this outputs me this ugly warning. The thing is that this is ugly. And uh, this is a game. OK, uh, maybe I want it to be playable. I don't want to have these ugly warnings on my face every time I play my game. And sadly, I didn't find any way to do a nice uh, output from my compiler at compile time. So if you have any idea on how to do this, please, 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 come to see me, and we can do the best game ever. <laughs> and that's it for me. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> do you have any questions? Yes. You had in the middle of the talk a tiny little detail, which was a magical function that has serialized. Yes. How would you implement that serialized? Uh, so, serialize is actually one of the things that will be still ugly in C17. Uh, I remember. Uh, where was it? Yes. Uh, this is. This is going to use Sfine somewhere to make this possible. And Sfine is uh, substitution failure is not an error, which is very hard to understand. Uh, so it's kind of a way to, you, it's a meta function, a function that runs at compile time, which is going to use some substitution failure to kind of detect the, the number function, if it's there or not. I did a talk on that earlier in this uh, meetup. Hmm? It's, on uh, it's on YouTube. Yeah. You want to use this Mac and have their own CPU to come here, maybe? This one? Yeah. This shows what Spin now is. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, this is also using Spin A, actually. But it's uh, using Studio and Relief to make it fancier. So it's that kind of tricks that you, you need to use. I could go into this in details, but it's very uh, like a rabbit hole. It took me uh, 30 minutes last time to explain just the, the base of it. OK. Yes. Hey. Yes. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I have to take a look on how I did that, but yes, it will return false in some ways. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Wondering if I didn't do any mistake in the slides, and maybe I need to do a CLA's V. I still need to use it that way. I don't remember if I did this. Sorry. Some other questions. Yes. So can you can you repeat? So yeah, <laughs> yes. No, I mean you can use LLVM to generate games. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We could that together, I guess, if you are willing to. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes. When you go to work in the game first time, will you be proud or will you be dirty? <laughs> A bit of both, I would say. But I didn't make it work like straight away. I had a lot of runtime. Was it runtime? No, I, I had a lot of uh, weird <coughs> compiling errors, and then I had to make it into runtime and debug and try again and again and again. It's not so fun actually to do. Other questions? All right, I think that's it. Uh, if you want to go into spinet detail, you, we, we can speak about that afterwards. That's it. <laughs>